Shano Bazinski, repeat from the Sandlot. Subscribe to DNC Digital. What's going on, everybody? It's your boy D from DNC Digital back with another episode of DNC Radio. My guest today is Shane Obadzinski. Shane is repeat from the Sandlot, <laughs> but that's not the only thing he's done. He's done some other projects and he's doing something really cool that's near and dear to my heart that involves food. So we're going to be talking about that throughout the interview. Shane, welcome to the show, man. Hey, well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me, man. Very cool. No, it's, it's really cool because, uh, I mean, people my age, this generation, we've we grew up on that on on the uh, on the uh, on the movie The Sandlot, and right. um, it's just it's something that's so timeless. And I I know you said in past interviews that you knew you were making something special, but you didn't you didn't project the long the longevity of this movie's life, did you? Uh, yeah, there's no way we would have imagined one people caring about it so deeply, but two just it being around and still somewhat relevant. Uh, almost 28 years later now. We're almost at the 30-year anniversary, which is wild. Yeah, I think it was the 20th or the 25th anniversary. You guys started doing a tour to promote everything. You started doing all the baseball parks? Yeah, right around, uh, right at the 25th, we did. We did a big party out in Utah for the 20th and 25th on the Sandlot. And that kind of, I think, sparked a lot of, uh, of interest again. Mm -hmm. And then we went to all the baseball stadiums for the 25th and We've been doing conventions and, and I mean, everything we can actually, you know. You know, when, when you're going to ballparks, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was interesting for you because when you see somebody in the street from a movie that you enjoyed, you know, you kind of freak out and, you know, you, you find yourself having fans that you wouldn't expect them to be fans. Now, people in the baseball world, in the sport, have come up to you and talked to you about how that movie has impacted them. What, was, what, was, what were those experiences like? It's very humbling, especially when you go to a place where there's other celebrities, you know, baseball players and, and people you look up to and, and yourself. And when they come up to you and, and push you aside and, and say, hey, this means the world to me. You know, you're one of my heroes and whatnot. And, and hearing huge baseball players, you know, Justin Turner is one of the ones that we've worked with before. And he's a great guy. And he he's, has a lot of love for us. And to hear him, you know, he's probably a Hall of Famer, you know to tell us that we're his heroes is, is crazy humbling. And we're, we're very lucky to have, have made such a positive impact, especially when there's so much negativity. No, oh, yeah, definitely. That, that's something we were just talking off camera. We're like, let's just have some fun during this hour. So it didn't start for you there. I learned that you were at a magic show and your mom kind of pushed you on stage and you participated we in, a in a magic show. So, so uh, I mean, do you remember that at all? Very little. I remember back in back in the eighties, the malls were a big deal. Like, and they would do like entertainment at the malls. Like bands would play and pageants and weird stuff. And they were doing a Garfield magic show. And my mom kind of told me to go up there, and, and I was all about it. So I, I made them pick me to do the magic magic trick. And when I got off, she said, "You might you might be good at this." And then she got me some agents, uh, and I guess it kind of worked out from there. Yeah, you ended up doing a Kool-Aid commercial. Uh, you were about three years old when you did the Kool-Aid commercial. That was my that first correct? bit, three years old Kool-Aid commercial. And uh, I did a ton of commercials in the first 10 years of my life. And then some movies and whatnot, and Sandlot when I was 10. So, yeah. Um, so when, when, you're, when you're already a child actor, do you ever look back at that time and have a sense of normalcy when you have your own memories against people who just went to public school and kind of just played in the sandbox? When I got, there wasn't a lot of work, and sometimes there isn't a lot of work for that age group when you're in your, your late teens and your voice is changing and you're going through puberty and stuff. So that, that part of my life into my early 20s, I, I wasn't acting at that, in that time period. I was doing music. I was in a band. And uh, I look back at how I was raised and how everyone else had old friends from high school or you know middle school, and, mm -hmm. and I didn't have any of that. So back then, I kind of felt, Maybe it was weird and not, not that I got cheated because in no, no capacity did I, but as I got older, I got to, to look at it differently and realize how lucky I was to have such a unique and different upbringing. And maybe that's helped keep me humble, I guess. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, um, 
I mean, you were a kid, so it, it was almost like you were led through all that stuff, you know, with, with your own talents, obviously. But, you know, getting to do what I do, I get to talk to a lot of cool people like yourself. And sometimes my daughter goes to shows with me and, cool. you know, we're cool with the local G League uh, basketball team. And we go to the Comic Cons and we're meeting everybody. And, you know, she gets right. to ride along. And, you know, one day I had to stop her and I'm like, hey, just so you know, nine-year-olds don't get to do this usually and it's it's just something that you need to appreciate something that is hard work and and uh it's not it's not it's not your normal memory as a kid so in in the movie industry they say it's the worst to work with kids and animals now the sandlot is something that has both it has beasts and it has all of you guys do you oh, guys yeah. feel like you gave them a hard time when when it came to work do we don't feel like that we know we gave it. Time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we didn't mean to. Uh, I mean, looking back, a lot of a lot of the boys and myself kind of say that, you know, one, it was the greatest summer of our lives, no doubt. Yeah. And two, it wasn't really that we were filming a movie. It was all of us just getting together, being best friends, and he got it on film. Because there's so much of that that movie in that experience that was just us having a good time being that sounds beautiful man 10 10 12 13 year old boys and then he wanted to throw an animal in there which made it harder for him right but uh no for us it was it was all fun but yeah there's no doubt we made that guy work harder than he probably wanted to <laughs> uh the owner of beast was james earl jones uh right. darth vader himself i i read um that you guys just fanboyed over him and rightfully so because he's darth vader and he's a brilliant actor is there anything that sticks out that you remember as far as like little conversations that he's had with you because i'm sure a man of his stature looked at all you young men and said i want to teach these guys something that they can take with them and maybe not in the acting field, but maybe in life. Is it any conversation with him that sticks out for you? Yeah, unfortunately, he was only there for, I think, just one day. So everything we did with him, we had to get done in one day. Might have been two, but the other part was maybe the exterior stuff. And I, I don't, regardless, it was a very short period of time we had. With yeah. Him. We all got to go meet him and sit down with him, you know, when he introduced us. And that was, of course, intimidating at first because we're all, you know, fans of Star Wars and, you know, we're worried about it. And when he talks, I mean, the ground shakes, you know, the sky opens up. He is, yeah, he demands everything when he opens his mouth and rightfully so. Uh, so I, it wasn't that he didn't give us any advice or any teaching. He, he treated us. And I think looking back, this was more important. He treated us like equal actors. Uh, obviously he was a, a big star and, and a legend and mm -hmm. he treated us like we could be legends too. So when we got to, to go film and we talked and we you know, went over our, our scenes, it was, it was like, he was on, he either put himself on our level or he made us meet him at his level. And that to me was the, the best lesson he could have given me because it wasn't, talking about acting it wasn't you know saying this or that it was this is how it's done and we're going to do it together and that gives you the confidence that you can do anything you want when you have someone around like that so if anything he just taught us with example and that was for me that was very powerful yeah i mean to even just sit in the same room uh it must have been crazy um oh yeah so now, now you know 20 25 30 years now we're about to hit the 30 year mark with the sandlot i know i feel old man stop <laughs> yeah I, f I feel old looking back i'm like holy <laughs> crap it was made at that time so you know i i'm showing my daughter the movie and i'm sure a lot of other people that grew up on it are showing their own kids the movie and what do you what is there to say about this new generation of fans that have learned about the sandlot and and the guys on the field and you know coming up to you at shows saying my dad or my mom and you know, I saw, I, you know, the little four or five year old kids. Uh, how do you feel when they come up to you more so than the adults? The kids uh, and Halloween just passed. So uh, every year people dress up as us and they take group photos dressed up like all of us in certain scenes. So Halloween's always a nice reminder that 
there's five-year-old, six-year-old kids out there who are looking up to you, dressing up as you running around getting candy. So that's very, very cool. When they come up and they're excited to meet you, at first there's the um, confusion of why don't you look like you do in the movie? <laughs> nice. And once they, they put that together, they're very happy and they want to tell you all about their favorite scenes and uh, that magic and, and the excitement they have about that movie. You know, they, they connect that with you and that is an incredible feeling. And then the other opposite spectrum is the older people. It's the people older than us, the people who are in their 50s and 60s who come up to us and they're almost, we've had grown men in tears before and they say that movie took place in, you know, 67, 65. And that was what we did in 65. Mm. You boys were exactly how we were raised. And they tell us watching that was, uh, you know, transcending for them and magical. And, and they're thanking us for reminding them what it's like to be children. And when you have a grown man, 65 years old, 70 years old, telling you, thank you for reminding what it's, them what it's like to be young. It's very powerful. And then they share it with their kids and their kids, their kids. And, and that's how it stayed alive for so long, but it, it's very powerful. The love people have. Yeah, for this, uh, like, to stay on that point. When I was a kid, we played tag. We played, we, we cut off the bottom of a basketball or um, excuse me. We cut off the bottom of a milk crate and use that as a basketball hoop. We would nail it to the telephone pole. Right. Um, we would play football on the street and said hey you know two completions is a first down or you know go to the chevy and make a left like these are all phrases that we all told each other right. and now with technology everybody sits at home on their ipads or on their phone and you know i'm, I'm guilty of it too you know Same. the idea of outside playing outside i feel is just getting smaller and smaller uh, as years go on now this movie you know, can save something like that when, if it's placed in the right, in, in front of the right person. You know, did you ever think of that when it came to all these years have passed by and people are still watching the movie? Maybe and maybe it can convince them of going outside and just playing a game of football or playing a game of baseball. That's a great thought. Uh, every now and then we get people who mention stuff like that to us. Like, hey, those times were better. I wish kids still did that, you know. You know, you guys reminded me how important it is to take my kids out and throw the ball around. So in some areas, not enough. It's happening. And that's cool. But I wish it could do it more, man, because you're right. All that technology and Fortnite and all that stuff, people are stuck behind their system all day and not going outside. So I mean, if that saved some of it, then great. But maybe we need more movies like that. And maybe the, the TV show will help, you know, get that going again. Let's hope so. Um, so you, you've gone on record that you're you're always up for talking about this movie. You're always you're always happy to look back at those memories. That can't be said for every child actor. I've I've interviewed child actors, and you know they're just you know I, I I've done other stuff where I don't really want to talk about that movie. I you know some people don't like to be known for one role. Um, wh why is it with you uh, in your experience? that you do enjoy being associated with this movie that was done 25 years ago? I think it's because the people, the, I mean, one, I, I've been lucky to not have any, any problems, any legal issues or anything like that. Yeah. You survived but, uh, that. It's, it's the fans. It's the people. They're so loving and gracious toward us that for me to not want to cherish that with them would be, you know, almost criminal. It'd be selfish. You know, they've given me, helped give me a, a good life and, and these good positive memories and the ability to to travel around America and, and go to conventions and meet people and see things that I probably never would have seen if it wasn't for this movie. And that's going on 28 years now. So I'm always happy to talk about it because it's been such a positive influence on my life that if I can share that with other people, why not? Hell yeah. What's it like uh, celebrating your 10th birthday on a movie set? <laughs> we went to a, um, a water park in Utah. Oh, damn. Yeah, and actually it was weird. We, we were back there for the 25th anniversary a couple of years ago, and we were driving somewhere, and we passed it. And, and I think Marty, who plays yeah, yeah, he goes, Shane, is that the, that the place we went to for your birthday party? 
so and cool looking, and it started to come back and i was yeah. like it is and i i mean i remember having my birthday in utah i remember having my birthday there i would have never remembered the details that came back when i saw it yeah and it's almost like a memory past, getting unlocked right it was it was yeah. awesome um so that was in the moment i thought it was just a regular birthday party you know we you know we, we went out and had some fun but looking back that might have been the greatest birthday ever but it, it's oh hell yeah i mean you're you were an actor on 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 a huge movie uh, not only a huge movie roger ebert at the time he compared it to a christmas story do you remember that comparison and how it made you feel um back then i don't i remember reading that as i got older and i thought like damn that's a nice compliment mm -hmm. yeah that's really nice in the moment the movie came out with good reviews and we were all happy about that but realistically in the first month or so it was forgotten um it did okay at the box office and you know it came out in the same year around the same time as jurassic park a bunch of other huge movies so it was quickly overshadowed and uh the, the the magic of it came later on as people you know became a cult people call it a cult classic sometimes and uh that's when it really started to click and i would look back at it and say some of these people said things about it like him for example mm -hmm. that really should have been listened to back then oh and, hell yeah uh, we got lucky i guess we got lucky <laughs> uh so I, I read that you didn't have uh you didn't always have a good time on set. You fought a lot with him. And what are you talking about nonsense. Oh, I mean I am am I reading the am I reading fake news now, Shane? No, 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 no. Um <laughs> But so since you were you were probably one of the youngest on the set. I was the youngest. Was, yeah. was it was it more of a big brother messing with little brother type deal? Because I have an Absolutely. older brother and as a kid I I you know I didn't I disliked the guy to, yeah. to a degree. But <laughs> there's no doubt and and the boys have been kind enough to remind me that i was the youngest meaning that back then i was the most annoying and that were you th do, do you back then were you uh, you know probably <laughs> you know, <laughs> probably probably i was 10 everyone was uh, i think 12 or 13 uh, i was probably definitely the most annoying and but it, 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 when I say we were best friends or like brothers, I mean that. Despite him and me got into it one day, mm -hmm. doesn't matter because the next moment, if someone picked on me or him, we both would have defended each other. Yeah, it was like a nobody can mess with him but me type deal. Exactly. Yeah. And that's and once it happened and it was over, I think literally within 30 minutes, we were back to playing again. You know, it's just it's kids will be kids and boys will be boys, and that's it boiled over for a couple of times and that's okay. Uh, I want to know what licorice and bacon bits taste like. I mean, awful. That, that was the, that was the substitute for the chewing tobacco, right? That's what you got. Black use? licorice and uh, beef jerky. Oh, is that what it was? Oh, geez. Black lic to my, might've been bacon bits. I, I feel like it was I, I read bacon bits jerky. on one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's possible. I remember it as the other two, but, uh, no, it was disgusting. It was awful. And so some I mean some of the some of the spitting up and the throwing up, that was all genuine. Those were just let the camera keep rolling. Definitely some of the faces, the the puke uh you know, reactions were legit because that it, it was gross. I mean, looking back, they obviously did it on purpose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because you gave them so much shit on set. <laughs> yeah, basically. They're like, all right, boys, <laughs> this is our time to get some, you know, revenge nice uh, but you know some of the 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 puke scenes you know you can tell there was the the hose on the side of our face and oh yeah 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 but but um besides those yeah there was some some of that was genuine that stuff was disgusting and then you throw that mixed in with being on the ride it uh mm -hmm. yeah deadly combination uh so i, <laughs> I that, that was one of the facts that was my favorite uh, another fact that I that I loved that I read because it's a favorite game of mine. Who was the character that you used to pick when you guys played Street Fighter? Oh man, I used to love Guile. Okay. Guile mm. was awesome, and uh, Blanca, Blanca, the green, the green one with the orange hair. Yeah, and he would get okay. all electrical. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that dude was bad. Dude Since was bad. you guys played so much, did you have any excitement toward the awesome movie that came out? 
<laughs> um, we it. were all thrilled about the movie that came out until we saw it. It's it's still it's so bad it's good to me at least. I I have to watch it again because it's funny you bring it up because someone else just recently brought up how good the Street Fighter flick was and I was like no way no no it's it's like oh God I mean are are any Van Damme movies like that cinematically technically great I mean and I'm I, I, that, I'm enough. speaking I'm speaking from opinion I love Bloodsport I love Kickboxer I love those movies but come no, on so do I like but my thing about the Street Fighter movie was just how over the top. Raul Julia did uh, M. Bison. That's right. He was M. Bison. Yeah. And that was his last, uh, I believe that was his last role before he unfortunately passed away. Even sick, he still went like 120% when it came to that character. And I, I, I always find myself watching that movie as, as bad as it is. It was just, it was great. And it always takes me back to playing the game as a kid. Oh, yeah. I remember we all bought, they had, we had Per Diem uh, every week for the movie and one week our parents let us all buy the super nintendo with the street fighter included it was like a pack of some sort and then we would all you kind of take turns to go to everyone's it? house i'm sorry oh you you pulled your money together to to get it yeah and then we uh we would all take turns oh, okay, going okay. to people's house to to play it it was awesome um so uh, another movie that you did was my girl uh, with Macaulay Culkin, mm-hmm. and um, I, I looked, looked up that movie. I mean, I've seen I saw of a of a movie like that and an ending like that. Child psychologists were hired to tell people that it's okay to bring their kids, in in fear of like, you know, the kids being traumatized watching, watching a movie like like that or watching an ending like that. When it comes to that, it, it made me think of something interesting. Do you think it's up to the parents or society itself to police children when they're playing video games or when they're watching movies? Hmm. Wow, that's a good question. Um, Thank you. Unfortunately, it's... No, I say unfortunately, but it's it's still mixed. Uh, it's got to be the parents. It all, it all comes back to the parents, I think. You know, sometimes corporations, they just want to make money. If they think they can get more kids in the seat by putting something awful in theaters that are that's a bad influence they will just to make money uh, they don't they don't care about the repercussions they don't care about the influence they want the money so a lot of times i feel it, it should come on the parents as to what is proper for them to see and experience i mean at the same time there should be responsibilities uh, with bigger studios and whatnot about how their their content gets viewed but uh, I don't know. It's probably the parents, man. It's a, it's yeah, a tricky, I would, I would, I would think so. It, it, is, it is a tricky subject. I mean, but it did make me think, like, is it up to the parents or is it up to society? Because a lot of responsibility is placed on both sides when right. a kid power bombs his sister and breaks her arm or something like that. Or, you know, Grand Theft Auto being way too violent for people. But it does have a rating that doesn't allow it to be sold to <laughs> You know, some children, but then the parents just buy it anyway because the kid won't shut up. So it's it, <laughs> it's like it's a double edged sword. Um, when you were when you were a child actor, do you remember doing press and and what that was like? I do. We uh, always had press for the movies we did. Sandlot was obviously the biggest one. Uh, we did. Uh, me and Victor went around. Uh, my brother in the movie went around the East Coast, up and down, and did press tours for that and that was always fun got to hang out with new people in new hotels and get interviewed on tv and that was always a whirlwind that was that was some good times uh so i, w- I want to talk about something that seems to be uh your passion because I-, I learned that after high school you you toured with a local band what was the band called uh, i did touring with uh the main band was called sacred cell okay and uh still talk to those guys uh, we still jam every now and then. What do you What do you um, play? I play drums. Uh, you might be able to. Oh, see I, it I, yeah, I was looking at that. I was like, maybe this guy can play some other stuff too. Yeah, I'm reading. My daughter, the, the my room. daughter just joined percussion and band, and she's very, very excited. Awesome! Yeah, I love it, man. I mean, I I play guitar and piano too, but uh, drums is drums is my love, man. I love that. Wow. No, no, no disrespect, but I just want to get it from a drummer's side, um, a drummer's point of view. It's it's more it, it's like 
the drummer seems to be the weirdest dude in the band because when you look at them, they have these awesome facial expressions and they're <laughs> so into it and they're just rocking out. And like I was showing her, like when she decided she was doing percussion, I was like, okay, I know she, she likes pink. She's 11, but she has an old soul. She likes ACDC. She likes Pink Floyd. She likes Bon Jovi and stuff. So I was like, okay, let's YouTube some, some uh, performances. And she was watching the ACDC at some award show where they were just fucking killing it. And she's like, dad, look at the drummer. He's so crazy. I'm like, I know, like they're, they're all so <laughs> crazy. Uh, is there something to be said about uh, the drummer of the band and what place he has in, uh, in their image? I mean, there's a reason why they're in the back all covered up by symbols, maybe. Nice. Um, <laughs> no, I, I was at a live show one time and uh, the, the singer came out and said, you know, introducing the band and he said, and the heartbeat, and he said the, the drummer's name of the band. And that always stuck with me that the drummer is the heartbeat. And a lot of the expression, you know, there's guitar players make crazy faces for their solos and mm -hmm. bass players, you know, do their thing and whatnot. Singers, of course, are different, different breed. Yeah. But uh, drummers, you, you're using every, every part of your whole body. Every part of you is sweating. You know, every, everything is moving. And, and of course, it's going to make funny faces. But at the same time, when you're into it and you're playing for a club with a couple thousand people, which I've been lucky to do a few times, um, it's something magical that you just, you, you feel everything and every pore is sweating. And every, every time you hit the drum, you get this energy and, you know, maybe that's where those weird faces come from, but yeah, it's a, it's a rush, man. It's a rush. I know. I bet it is. If, if you can compare yourselves to anybody, just as far as the sound is, like what did what did what did you guys sound like back then? Um, back then, anybody we you tried were, to emulate? We kind of got the Deftones a little bit back okay, then. Okay. Okay. Um, we weren't as uh, aggressive or screamy per se, mm. but a lot of the Deftones, a lot of uh, I don't know, a band like Thursday. If you're familiar with Thursday. I'd, I'd have to look those guys up. I'm not yeah. sure. But it's just uh, hard rock, but not crazy hard rock. You know, not not alternative, but not metal. Just something with a good groove and some energy and, you know, some passion. If you, if you guys were doing that after high school, what, what posters were on your wall during high school? Oh, man. I mean, I had, I had the, the, the Staples and the Metallicas, the Pink Floyds. Um, you can't see them, but I still got some some Zeppelin pictures up. Uh, Radiohead was was a big influence back then. Uh, still is, of course. But uh, Pearl Jam too. You know, uh, those guys are jamming. How, how how cool is it to watch those guys? You know, when you talk about some of those bands been inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I showed my daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. It was it was hard getting inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and <laughs> she watched. The blonde, I'm sorry, I, I can't, her name escapes me, but not the lead singer, but the blonde girl. And she sees her like just killing it on the guitar. And she's like, she's like, dad, she looks like a teacher. I'm like, I know, but she is a <laughs> badass. She is a badass when it comes to rocking out. Um, it's so cool to see them. It's like, it's because they're there with their families. Right. And it's like, it's like they turn to their little kids. They're like, I'll be right back. Daddy needs to go to work. And like when dad goes to work, like they, they work and, you know, the women also are part of these are part of these awesome bands in, in the case of heart. Um, do you feel that same energy? Like even when you guys just jam out sometimes just for shits and giggles? For sure. Like we all, I mean, we got some, some, some good fame, I guess, from, from it. Never, never got signed sadly, but we, we always drew a really good crowd. So when we're jamming and hanging out together, we feel we feel lucky, you know, we feel energized about it when we play and it definitely brings back those emotions and feelings of, you know, what could have been, you know, unfortunately it didn't go all the way, but yeah, I mean, when, when we, when we put down our day jobs and get in the, get in the band room and go to town, it's, it's, it's like we're 18, 22 again, you know, it's especially, fantastic. especially as the drummer, because those limbs need to be limber, right? Whew, tell me about it, man. It's not as easy as it used to be. <laughs> 
Hey, uh, I, I, I saw a tweet that I think you replied to or you retweeted. Um, you were the victim of a celebrity death hoax. So Eric Andre put on Twitter that everybody from the Sandlot is dead. <laughs> what, what was that about? Was he being serious or was he just being a dick? I, don't, I have no idea. I'd like to think he was just being, being funny. Uh-huh. And I don't even really remember how the people reacted to it. No, everybody oh, was wow. everybody was heartbroken. A lot of people were confirming it. They're like, "Oh, I know, it's so sad, isn't it?" I was like, "What the? Oh fuck? wow, I didn't know it went that far." It Damn. did. People were people were doubling up with the guy. Well, that's I mean that's 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 unfortunate, man. Yeah, I, it sucks to be dead. But uh, you're you're still you're still keeping it alive <laughs> somehow. Um, yeah, magic. You you are um, the. Uh, owner of New York Times Square Pizza in Tampa. I'd like to know mm-hmm. what, what's the most challenging thing about running a food business? In the early days, it was keeping it together as far as your product, getting out to the customer with consistency. And then of course, there's the, the first couple months of, are people even gonna like it? You know. Mm-hmm. Once you get that out of the way, there's the commitment you have to yourself and the, the people who are spending their hard-earned money with you to give them consistently good product. Uh, once that got under control and I felt comfortable with, with focusing on different things and that the food was going to be under control, the hardest thing is dealing with employees. Uh, customers are cool, difficult sometimes, but employees is the, the most uh, challenging thing. Management, I guess. Yeah, I, I've, I've spent some time in food management and I, I, yeah. can, I can concur. One everyone thing that wants I... To, everyone wants the job. They want to make money, but they don't want to... Put the work in. Exactly. Yeah, some people come to work and some people come to work. There's a difference. Big time. That was something, that was something I, I taught my kids. One thing that I always wondered, uh, being from New Jersey, I always wanted to open up a sandwich shop. Oh. I live in South Texas and I just wanted to... I, I don't know. I just want to give that city feel. Like you walk into a place, I'm wearing a white apron and my Yankee hat and a white t-shirt and you know, I just make you a sandwich and you know, you sit down, you have your coffee and you, you read your newspaper. I wanted to put that into South Texas. Now, the only thing is you're opening up a New York Times Square pizza in Florida. Right. Do you think something that is not a native, you know, food or idea was a difficult thing to sell to the public? Um, it is and it isn't, uh, there's familiarity, which always works in your favor. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe that's why taco places are so popular at first. Everyone likes tacos, you know, um, (laughs) everyone likes pizza. We, um, we weren't a big fan of the name and we've actually kind of since changed it a little bit and we're about to, to rebrand completely to get any, get rid of any of the, the New York vibe. Um, it's worked for us as far as being a legit brick oven pizza shop and it's worked against us because people have expectations. Right. And sometimes that's unfortunate. Um, Like I've been in New York city several times and I'm far from a pizza master, but it's weird that every pizza shop in New York city tastes different. Uh, At least it did to me. They're all similar, you know, thin, crispy, blah, 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 but they're all, they all have different things about them. So what's your favorite spot in New York? If, if, if I can ask, Oh, it, it's going to be cliche, but Familio's has that really good Sicilian. Uh, oh, I, like I love that. Sicilians. Did you ever try Joe's in Brooklyn? No, it's been a part of a few movies. I think it was in Spider-Man and some Jennifer Lopez movie. I think Conan O'Brien did a skit there where he worked there for like a second. It's, it's really, really <laughs> good. That's awesome. Uh, I heard, I also heard the myth that, different you know different climates also make different pizza i've learned that because of the humidity in san francisco you can never make a pizza like it does taste over there because of the way the yeast rises and stuff like that it's possible that's something we fight with every day if it's hotter outside or if it's colder outside you know when we make the dough we can't leave it out to to proof as long as we can on on chillier days or you know we've got to put it away quicker if it's hotter so there's always, it's, it's almost like you're dealing with something that's alive. I mean, yeah. yeast is alive, so there's obviously that. But 
you have to you have to, to pay attention to it and put it away when it's right. And, when uh, you talk about consistency, I, I, I thought about, you know, the, my dream of the sandwich shop. Like I said, uh, it's it's familiarity that it, it's not really over here. They're so used to one type of food in South Texas that they don't know what like a brioche bun is or pastrami or prosciutto like they're you know, I feel like they're, maybe they're too scared to try something new. But the thing is, you know, in the event that I ever, ever open it, right, I know how to make you a sandwich that's going to knock your socks off. But how do as a, as a as a food business owner, as a restaurant owner, how do you trust somebody else with your baby when it comes to that? Like in terms of opening a second location, how do you trust somebody with something that you're very passionate about? That was that was one of the tricky and, and parts and the hardest things to do. That's what took us so long to to really get myself and you know my business partners off the the kitchen line and in a different position. You know when you're dealing with with kids in charge of of what you've worked on your whole life. Uh, that that was tricky. Um, I mean, it's training. It's it's teaching them how important the small things are, and it's all about finding people who everyone cares when they're getting paid, but it's finding the people who are understanding of why they're getting paid. And once you have that, mm. that click with certain people, you know, they, they're proud of what they're doing as well, you know? And right now we've had, we have the best crew. We've had it for about two years, the best crew we've ever had. And I'm, I, I've been there less now more than ever been able to do other things and focus on different projects because my crew there understands how, how important it is to, to keep that going because it, it's job security for them. And it means a lot to me. So they got my back. So I'm very grateful. That's awesome. It, it's good when, uh, you know, I, I try to, you know, teach people who are moving up, you know, like from a, what they call a team member to like a team leader and then, you know, management and stuff. And I, I tried to tell them like it, a lot of it has to do with you because you don't want that kid to do it just because it's their job. You want it to do it because it's you. Right. Like they can be tired and they're like, Oh no, but it's Shane. I'll do anything for Shane. Yeah. I'll, I'll stay an extra few hours or yeah, I'll do that, you know, dirty job for Shane. I, I love Shane, you know? And that was the, that was one of the trickiest parts for me in restaurant management. So um, being a pizza guy, I want to know if you can settle this debate. Do oh, pineapples belong on pizza? Do I like them on pizza? Do they no. belong on pizza? Do they belong on pizza? Absolutely. Oh, Jesus. I'm sorry. That was like a double-sided answer, man. What the hell is that? <laughs> I've been in so many debates about that damn pineapple. Oh, I think man. it's I, I, dumb. It, it doesn't make <laughs> sense. I think it's straight up I dumb. Think it's dumb. But who am I to tell you you can't put pineapple on pizza? If you like it, I might question your taste buds. I might question your reality. But if you like it, whatever, man. You know, I like black olives and chicken on my pizza. Some people think black olives are gross. Uh, I don't know. They, well, I think they are. But who am I to <laughs> tell you, right, Shane? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I would love to to uh man i would i don't know if i'm ever gonna go to florida but i would love to uh stop by your place and um uh, be uh, as they as as you called it in an interview be one of your re repeat customers repeat customers that's right uh dude if you're ever in florida you know my guest you know my treat please 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 that would be that would be awesome it's been so cool to uh talk to you uh i want to i want to thank you so much for doing this it, it's it, you know, I, I always, um, they always tell me like, Hey, you know, play it cool and keep your poker face, but I want to enjoy the, the cool moments that I get to do. So talking to repeat from the sandlot, uh, was a cool one for me. Um, I want to thank you for doing, uh, the show. Um, anything you got coming up? I know, I know the TV show is coming up. Are you a part of that? We are all a part of that. Um, that was, that's in different stages of development right now. And, for the moment, I, I hate to blame anything about it, but the, the pandemic has kind of slowed the process down. Mm. I know we were supposed to film earlier this year. That got canceled, obviously. And we're kind of just waiting for that project to get put back together. And we're hoping early next year, if things are better and we can tackle that project properly. But uh, 
they're you know committed, what that, we're committed. That's another thing about the movie industry. Like, there's one blockbuster left. We all remember going to Blockbuster and like renting movies. Oh yeah, you know, the Redbox kind of killed it, and then Netflix kind of killed all that, and oh, to yeah. the point that now, you know, Mulan was released on Disney Plus, and Borat was released on Amazon Prime. Do you feel that the red carpets and movie theaters in itself are going to be the VCR of the movie industry? I've kind of been talking about this a lot and been asked about this before. I do not. I I think. Um, the streaming stuff is fantastic. It's easy. I'm guilty of, of, you know, subscribing to a few of the streaming services and watching them more than I should. Um, mm -hmm. there's, especially after the pandemic, people are going to re remember how important it is to go out and experience small things. And it's annoying when you have people talking in theaters or kicking your seat or whatever, but there's nothing more powerful than going to a movie theater not just the big screen, not just the sound, but when you're laughing with strangers, when you're surprised with strangers, when you're all feeling that same energy watching a movie, you know, Jurassic Park, for example, you know, sitting in the theater back in 94 watching that, myself and everyone in the theater were on the edge of their seat and you could feel their energy. People are going to re remember how important that is and cinemas will, will always thrive in some capacity. Yeah, there, there's some movies that you know, you see the trailer and you're like, oh, that's a good one. We could probably pick it up. And then there's some that you see and you're like, no, we have to experience that in the theater. Yep. Absolutely. You know, I'm sure a lot of people felt that way when they saw the trailer for Street Fighter. You know, I remember me and my friends opening weekend. There was two theaters in town. We didn't know which one was going to get the big movie. We always had to check the paper Friday morning. And when we did, we would make plans to go to that theater at this time. And, and, and that was it. We would get dropped off and go see said movie. And I know we did it with Street Fighter. Got it. Remember the newspaper? When yeah. I had to check things and a TV guide? What the hell was that? <laughs> uh, some things Shane, are easier, but some things are worse. Where can they find you on social media, sir? Uh, it's my name, Shane Obazinski. Uh, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, no longer on Facebook. And uh, that's it, man. Uh, a lot of good things coming up, I hope. I'm, I'm dedicating more time to doing some more of my projects and putting them out there. So we'll be seeing a lot more of me, I hope. That's uh, so awesome. Again, I thank you for that. And I'm going to put you on the spot for just a second. Can I send you some acting reels? And then, you know, you put me in one of your next projects. Maybe I can be in the Sandlot TV show. Why not? Why not, right? Did everybody hear that? Why the hell not? If we're putting pineapple on pizza, why not this? Yes. I, I mean, don't want to be compared to pineapple on pizza, but I'll take it. I already know you're going to be better than pineapple on pizza. Oh hell yeah! So, so you're, you're set. We'll be. We'll, uh, I'll bring. I'll bring you a jar of olives when I meet you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> uh, all the links in the description to uh, follow Shane. Make sure you do because you got the Sandlot coming up. You got some big things coming up. Um, this is D. You can find me at DNC Digital on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate everybody uh, always listening in every week. Uh, you guys don't know what, what it means to me. It's it's really cool. I was having this conversation earlier with somebody and I just, I do what I can. I try my best and I can only hope that people respond positively. And um, guys, that was repeat from the Sandlot. Again, DNC Digital on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Shane Obaziski on Twitter and Instagram. Everybody have a good night and take care of yourselves.